Hello. Hi, Annie. How are you? I'm good. How are you? I'm wonderful. Nice to, nice to meet you. Nice to meet you as well. Where are you located? I'm in Sur uh, Surrey, BC, Canada. Okay. <laughs> I love the Canadians. I just love how you guys roll. You got the socialized medicine. They give grants yeah. to artists all the time. When something calamity happens in America, the Canadians always respond six months before we even think about it. It's just, it's, it's nice. It's refreshing. So I'm, um, yeah, I don't know how things are going right now in Canada, but <laughs> well, yeah, nothing is a utopia, but there's just so many good things. Yeah, but, there is. Definitely but anyway, like that for that socialized healthcare. Oh, health. man. I, I just don't know what the, what the whole rancor is with it down here. Like right now though, it's really broken, honestly. Is it and, really? Yeah, it's so broken. Like it takes months and months, sometimes even years to get in to see specialists here. Wow. And it's, the thing I don't agree with is I think we should have the option to get private if we want. Yeah. Because yeah. sometimes people can hold a fundraiser or sometimes people just can afford it. Yeah. And, and if it would take some of the pressure off the public system, then I think that's a good thing. So, yeah. but having only private or only public healthcare and not allowing private is, I don't, I don't know. I don't agree with that. I get it. I, it's kind of like not having enough political parties to choose from. You know, there should yeah. be some level of choice, right? <laughs> totally. So, well, hey, it's great to meet you. And before we get into your life, you're very busy. I want to know, how did you survive COVID? How did you get through the last three years? And how has it changed you now that we're in this kind of post-pandemic era of our lives? Well, fortunately for me during COVID, I was working for myself. So I didn't have to worry about losing my job or making any of those kinds of difficult decisions. I almost died in the past from a vaccine injury. So I was too scared to get the COVID vaccine. Yeah. So I was one of those people who was kicked out of restaurants and feeling very, you know, um, kind of disliked <laughs> in society during yeah. COVID. Uh, but I had medical reasons for my choices. However, it just, it was a very strange time. I think the hardest part for me getting through COVID was the mental aspect of it because I didn't realize I was already, I've always, always kind of been a person that isolates and I didn't realize that the little amount of socialization that I did get in my life was so important to me until it was gone. So I found that really difficult. I didn't have very many friends, really any friends. I mostly just was the type of person who would go places and then leave when I wanted to Right. and never had to make any plans. Yeah. So that has changed me. I have developed some really close friendships with people and I've made it a priority in my life. That was a big, huge benefit of COVID. That's the irony, I think, of living through that time period was we had all these tools to connect, whether it's Zoom or whatever it is. But ultimately, at the end of the day, we realize that that human community that we have is very important and it's very necessary. And I don't think we didn't realize it. I think it got magnified. So, yeah, it was a pretty mm -hmm. big deal. I agree. It was such a hard time because there was so much division. And to be mentally healthy through that experience, you had to see the the other side as people that you care about and that you accept and love and you don't have to agree with and to be able to get through it mentally you had to be able to give up like like not not immerse yourself in the fears the fears of the pandemic the fears of everything that was happening you know and I think there was just so much fear and fear is just so toxic and it just incapacitates you but it really tested people and I think some people came out a lot worse off and some people didn't even make it through and some of us came out stronger, I think. And that's where I, I land on that on Yeah, that continuum. <laughs> I agree. I think for America and even the world, if we would have had someone like Obama leading things here, mm -hmm. it would have been so much better because, I mean, really a, a whole host of other presidents. But we had a lunatic running our our bus and running mm -hmm. it to the edge of the, the proverbial cliff. While we also got into a race riot with with George Floyd, there were so many things. It's like America can't just be OK with one calamity. We have to just squirt gasoline on the fire all the time. We have to just make it an inferno. And I think if we would have felt like we had 
leadership that steered us in one logical path, I think it would have been so much more comforting, not only to us as Americans, but the rest of the world to be like, all right, this really mutated greatly on this hunk of North America. Okay. But there's someone mm -hmm. logical that's running the ship. We know what's going on, but we didn't have that. And it heightened all of these like, you know, conspiracy theories and all of these like subtext groups that believe in weird things. So, yeah, I mean, there could have been a lot of things that would have been more logical <laughs> that would have yeah. made it easier. I think just the whole division aspect, and I, I agree with you, like the leadership is so important. And if your leaders are a part of why your society is so divided, then that is going to make everything so much worse. Yeah. And, you know, the that is one of the biggest problems in our society. And we, we have division when we put ourselves in all these different categories and label ourselves. And then on top of it to have like a pandemic and the media and all of this further fueling division and politicians fu fueling it and fueling it, it's, it just made for such a sick society, you know, yeah. and it's just a, I think it's really important, especially for people with a voice like you and people willing to like put a put their faces out there and and say something to you know create unity yeah between us all you know because we are all human beings yeah yeah and we're not going to agree on everything and if we don't have free speech then what do we have and you know it's just so important that even if we don't agree with each other that we respect each other's right to exist and have a voice Absolutely. Which is what I think is so therapeutically good about podcasting. You know, I've been doing this in jazz radio, so to speak, for a long time. And then all of a sudden, it's this thing that people are grabbing onto. And mm -hmm. I kind of branched a little bit more on doing a lot of different interviews. And I think that's the thing is that it really does give us all a level of common ground and to see each other in a light that's very appropriate as human beings, because we are a lot more alike. We are a lot more unified than we are disenfranchised or separate, mm -hmm. you know? So absolutely. Yeah. And coming great. from the adult entertainment industry, that's so huge because people, people just have stereotypes about people like me, but then when they meet me, Oh, she's just a regular mom. Right. You know, she's normal, just right. like me. There's really no difference. Uh, I just have a little bit more of a, an exciting job. <laughs> right, right, right. And I think it's levels of freedom that people might want to feel like they could do themselves to a certain degree, because I think mm -hmm. it's like that whole quote from Charles Bukowski. We're all born geniuses and buried idiots. As we get older, we put walls up around everything we do. We mm -hmm. put fears up around everything. We say we can't do this. We say no more than we say yes. And it's a problem. And if you have that spirit in you that's freer than other people, it shouldn't be anybody else passing judgment on that. It should be you doing what you do and everybody else can just live with it. So absolutely. So let, let's get to the brass tacks of exactly what you do. Sure. If I put you at a career day at a grade school, even junior high, and one of the kids looks up and says, hey, what do you do for a living? How would you answer that child? I would say that I am an author and a speaker. Okay. And that I have always worked for myself and I've also worked in entertainment. When it comes to children, I'm very age appropriate when I talk about my work. Yeah. Because I have children. Yeah. And I'm clearly not going to talk about inappropriate subjects with children. So trying to raise my children to understand that I work in adult entertainment without disclosing information that they don't need to know at their age it's it's a tricky balance but what I've tried to do and what I always do with younger people is just age appropriate we're not going to get yeah. into details you don't discuss that kind of thing with your with your children so you know when my for instance when my uh, oldest daughter was really young she asked me mom what is an exotic dancer and I said it's a beautiful dancer. <laughs> there you go. And then when she got a little older, she asked me what I was doing when I was putting my costumes in my bags. And they were like, you know, skimpy little costumes. And she said, you know, what is that, mommy? And oh, these are the costumes that I wear when I dance. You wear that? There, you know, there's hardly any material there. 
Yeah. <laughs> she didn't put it in those words, but I could tell that that was her impression. And I said, yeah, I, I dance in really sexy clothes for, you know, and that was, you know, pre-teenage. Then into the teens, they, they start hearing what a stripper is and they know what it is. And, and then, uh, I don't know. It's just a lot of it is I have allowed my children to kind of like put two and two together as yeah. they get older because yeah. neither of us wants to have that conversation, but also without lying and also being available to have that conversation if they do want to. Yeah. And especially with me writing books now and coming out on podcasts, I've had to be very clear with them that this is what I want to do. I hope that you're comfortable with it if you're not i'm sorry but i feel strongly that i have nothing to be ashamed of and i have a message that i want to put out there and i'm one of the few people willing to put a face to this industry i think it's important for people to put a face to especially really stigmatized industries yeah especially people like me because i I when you think of a person in adult entertainment, you probably think of someone who is very confident, put together, healthy, works out all the time, cares so much about their appearance. Uh, very, um, you might glamorize it. I don't know, but in my case, I'm a mom. I have health challenges. I have a disability. I have gone through a lot of trials in my life that keep kind of setting me back, setting me back, but I just keep, keep going and keep chugging along. Sure. And, and I'm just, you know, I'm that person. Like I, I'm a person who I'm, I'm like everyone else, except for maybe that I know how strong I am and I know I can overcome anything. And so that's, something that's like part of my superpower and I try to share that with people and that's what I'm trying to do from like my books and stuff is just teach people the stuff that I wish someone taught me or the stuff that people did teach me and now I want to teach them yeah for sure so what did you want to be when you were in the third grade what was your dream to grow up and become I wanted to be a writer nice so that's and I a... never did it. I never followed it. I, my dream until just now and in the past few years, and I'm 49 now. So right on. Yeah, that's awesome. Yeah, it's never too late to do whatever you want. That's for sure. Mm -hmm. um, so talk to me a little bit about where you were born and raised and kind of how some of these seeds were planted into you to 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 be a writer and to be in entertainment and to, and to have this life that you have. Well, I, I honestly, I grew up in a smaller town with a lot of alcoholism around me and poverty and so I became a, a little bit of an activist at a young age because these people that I loved that were in my life were always stigmatized and discriminated against and and I was always you know standing up for them and uh, it bothered me how society looks down on people like criminals and whatnot <laughs> Yeah, And so that was kind of where I was at because these were the people I loved and the people that I grew up around. However, my mother was a strong feminist. And back then, especially, and even still today, feminism is largely opposed to the adult entertainment industry. And so I had, I had like more of kind of like a, a um, outcast, lifestyle upbringing type of childhood but I also had expectations to go on to college and uh, be a feminist and all of that kind of stuff and I did go on to college just like my mom wanted me to but it just was it didn't resonate with me and years later when I moved to the big city I was struggling so much financially I I just said I can't this just isn't enough for me anymore, being a student and being poor. And I had a friend who was a dancer, so I decided to try it out. And that was just unbelievable. The door opened up for me and I suddenly didn't have to struggle financially anymore. And I really enjoyed dancing. I enjoyed 
I just loved it. I enjoyed all all aspects of it. Obviously, there are going to be aspects in any job that aren't that great. But yeah, I liked dressing up and I liked having control over when I worked. And I liked making as much money as I could make based on how hard I worked. And right. it was just a new a new kind of paradigm shift for me that there was a possibility of a better life out there. Yeah. I really w- grew up like with limited imagination, honestly. Yeah. yeah. Well, let me ask you this. Who's been kind of a hero that's fueled you throughout your life? Oh, I've had so many, but I think the the big hero that really kind of turned my life around started with a book and it was by Wayne Dyer. Okay. There was a spiritual solution to every problem. That book really changed me. That took took the the scared, angry little girl that I, you know, struggled to set free as I as I made my way in my life. And it it turned me into a woman that wanted to be a better person and saw a possibility of a better future and realized and was able to look at myself and realize my part in my circumstances and the role that I was playing and and the mistakes I was making in my relationships. And before that, I'd never really had anyone demonstrate that kind of mindset to me or that w- that way of thinking. And I'd been exposed to Christianity and, and spirituality in, in other ways. And it had impacted me positively, but it hadn't had the same impact that Wayne Dyer had. So that was a huge, huge turning point. And that that happened right before like a major uh, devastating tragedy in my life. So I, I was on a, a high, like a super spiritual high of Wayne Dyer when I became suddenly disabled. Wow. And, and that book and books like that got me through that time for sure. So if you can meet anybody alive on the planet right now, and spend some time with them. Who would it be? Anyone alive? Yeah. Hmm. I think. I think that's so hard. There's so many. <laughs> There's so many, but I think I'd want to meet Norma Jean Almodovar. She is a woman who lives in the States. We're actually friends on Facebook and we've done zoom hangouts a few times, but I'd love to meet her in person and spend an afternoon with her. She, she used to be an LAPD police officer and she left that work to become a sex worker. Okay. And then she wrote a book about it called cop to call girl. And I've always loved her because I saw her on a talk show. I think it might've been Donahue or something. And, uh, she, she, I don't know. she's just very amazing the the stories that she tells and I probably I don't know what I can say and what I can't say on your podcast but she's she just was would say the most incredible things that I loved that you don't hear from everybody you know she was asked what are you going to tell your grandchildren about your work <laughs> and she said I'll tell them I was the best beep in town <laughs> <laughs> yeah but uh, anyway I just thought that was so awesome yeah. because you know taking um taking pride in what you do and not letting society tell you what's right or what's wrong I I mean I can understand why people ha- would have a problem with different things and and have their opinions and have their feelings but it it's different if you actually have experience that's right. all I can say. Yeah. Once you have, once you walk in my stilettos, then I-, I would love to have a conversation and see Absolutely. what you think. You know. Absolutely. Speaking of walking in the stilettos, what is the motivation for you every day? What is it that gets you out of bed? What is it that gets you moving? What do you look forward to and want to get done? What What is that for you? Well, there's two two areas for that. One is my my books I just have so many books I want to write and I write a lot I love writing so I I get out of bed every day excited about the things that I want to write (laughs) and I also get out of bed every day excited to connect with the people in my life and that's been a huge thing as well from going through all my health challenges and you know surviving so much I've survived so much in my life and a huge 
blessing is how close I am to my children and my partner. So I just, I love waking up and knowing that I'm going to see the people that I care about every day. So you mentioned survival. Are you like a cat? You got nine lives? I mean, how? I think I must be. <laughs> <laughs> There's always something in there. What's been the best fan letter or best response that you've ever gotten from somebody based on the work that you've done? Something mm -hmm. that puts a smile on your face. You always remember. I had a client send me a message saying that uh, basically that it was the, the time that he had spent with me was the first time that he felt like real and human and valued and valuable in a really long time and that he couldn't express in words how meaningful that was. And then that was very early on. And then I've had countless similar messages like that. And I just think that what I've learned working in my industry is that one-on-one -on -one connections are the most important connections that we make one-on-one. -on -one. And we can't even begin to heal the division in our society until we, we, speak to each other like you and I are speaking to each other like yeah. face to face and one-on-one -on -one and understanding and relating to each other we might not agree on everything and we probably don't but to be able to just see the humanity in each other and realize and recognize that we all have our own reasons for coming to the conclusions that we come to and it's just not like that these days. Everyone's on the internet. We're connected, but we're not having connections, yeah. you know? And it's just the, the, the way that people can behave when they don't have to face each other. It's oh. so sad, you know? Yeah. It's bad. It's really bad. So of all of the things that you've overcome, all of the things that you've done and achieved in your life, what are you the proudest of? I am the proudest of the mother that I've become because I started out not very good. <laughs> I had learned from very authorita authoritarian parents. And so my oldest child is the one that I would yell at and, you know, tell her what to do. And it worked. She, she was responsive to that. And so I was like, I must be a good mother. And then my son came along and that didn't work with him. <laughs> he would get way worse. And I had to learn new ways to communicate as a mother. I had to learn how to talk and communicate and and meet on an eye to eye level and also forgive and understand and accept and not take it personally when my children didn't behave exactly how I thought they should behave. Yeah. And then over the years, like, I mean, I don't, I never yell. I don't yell at my children. I don't yell at my partner, but there was a time when I was that woman, you know, and it's just so crazy looking back. But my children today, they are 12, 18 and 23. And they, all three of them are just incredible human beings. And they are so, we're so close and we talk about everything. And my son's a writer like me. So we, we bounce ideas off each other all the time. I and mean, it's just cool. my, my proudest thing I've ever done definitely is raising my children to be really good people. <laughs> yeah. So let me ask you this. Everyone has a perception of you out there, family, friends, fans, readers, clients, colleagues, but you run the show. What's your perception of you? Who do you think you are? I think I am stronger than I ever realized for a long time. I'm, I've come to a point now where I realize that I have the tools to be unbreakable and that no matter what obstacle comes into my path, that I can handle it. And I don't have to worry about it in advance because when it happens, I'll handle it. And that is just, I think, like the most empowering thing to, to not fear the future anymore I have this fear of like you know really going hard with my business and trying to get my face out there for my books and everything and I'm forcing myself through that fear but I'm not scared of people trash talking me I'm not scared of people attacking me I'm not scared of 
my future health issues or anything that that may may or may not happen in the future i i'm unbreakable <laughs> that's excellent so if anyone wants to get your books learn more about you anything pertaining to your world where can they go annietemple.com okay One and it's track. for anyone even if you're just curious <laughs> okay cool annie this has been wonderful thank you so much for your story and for opening up best of luck with everything thank you so much i thank look you. forward to uh checking out your podcast again in the future absolutely thank you take care bye